he uses even your shameful remembrances of your past failures. In fact, not only does he use them, he often brings them up. I want to push the implications and the application of the text just a little bit further by asking the question. It's it's a question that we've already asked. We've already asked the question, what is God's forgiveness not? But let's ask that question a little more pointedly and let's let the text lead us into what I believe are some very important implications about the forgiveness of God that is extended to us to help us as the forgiven sinners of God, to do battle against sin in this life, understand our life in Christ more fully, and scorn the cunning efforts of the enemy. Because we have an enemy who seeks to sow tares, not only in the church of Christ, but also in our mind. He seeks to sow tares in our mind, tares that will cause us to make false connections between what the forgiveness of God is and what the forgiveness of God does for us and what it does not. We have an enemy that seeks to lead you to believe that the forgiveness of God is promised to do things that it is not promised to do. And his tactic is this. Once you believe that, that creates disillusionment in your heart. It creates disappointment. It causes you to doubt the forgiveness of God. It causes you to doubt your own faith. It causes you to doubt God's willingness to forgive. Why? Because the enemy has caused us to have unbiblical expectations for the forgiveness of trespasses. Okay, So that's what we're going to talk about for the remainder of the time. And there are basically, there's more than three, but there's basically three that I want to let the text lead us into exploring this morning. First of all, the first thing, well, just let's take a look at how I phrase this. The The forgiveness of sins is not necessarily. Now, what I mean by this, and I'll repeat this just to make sure we get it. The forgiveness of God is not necessarily. What that means is, as we talk about some of these things, This doesn't mean that God doesn't do this, that God doesn't extend these gracious blessings to us. But what it does mean is that our forgiveness is not contingent upon these things. Okay? That'll make more sense as we go along. So number one is this. The forgiveness of sins is not necessarily the end of our disappointment in ourselves. The forgiveness of our sins is not necessarily the end of your disappointment in yourself. Now, disappointment in ourselves is something that's that, that's common to all of the human experience. I doubt there's ever been... If there's ever been a human that lived without disappointment in themselves, then they were a sick person. Because all of us know this feeling of disappointment in self. Here's the thing, though. For the Christian, disappointment in self is like it takes steroids. It it gets ramped up into a whole different level. And here's why. Disappointment in self is fed, it's nurtured, it's grown by the Christian's increased awareness of sin, increased sensitivity to sin, and increased understanding of the severity of sin. Those things come together to cause the Christian to struggle with great times of self-disappointment. So disappointment in self. When we are forgiven, when when we stand before God as the forgiven sinners that we are in the body of Christ, And then there is moral failure in our life. That moral failure can then cause us to enter into this tailspin time of self-disappointment. 
One of the places to see this in Scripture with the greatest of all clarity is Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, Paul is just being so transparent with his own struggles with self-disappointment. Listen to his words. And as I read these words, these are these won't be on the screen, it's too long. But in Romans chapter 7, just listen. Just listen to Paul's words of self-disappointment. For I do not do the good that I want. But the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, But I see in my members, in other words, in the members of my body, I see another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And Paul goes on from there. Oh, who is going to deliver me from this body of sin? And that leads him, of course, into one of the most glorious chapters of Scripture, Romans 8. But can you hear Paul's disappointment in himself? Can you hear how Paul is just struggling with the evil that he says lies far? No. He says it's right beside me. It's right with me. Can you hear just his words? He is the forgiven child of God, and yet he wrestles so deeply with this sense and disappointment in me, in Paul, in Shaul. The forgiven sinner, the forgiveness of God brings to us a new sharpness in our perception of sin, a new awareness of the depth of our depravity, and a greater understanding of the severity of that sin. And those things can come together to cause your sense of self-disappointment to be working overtime. Now, God's forgiveness, when God's forgiveness is given to us, does the Scripture teach that that's removed and taken away? Pop psychology would tell us so. I would suggest to us this morning that if if we were to take a poll, maybe get ten Christians in a room and take a poll and say, of those ten Christians, how many of you believe that when God forgives you that the self-disappointment should go away? How many of those ten do you think would say, well, yeah, I think that's biblical. We know a lot, like Joel Osteen, that would say, yeah, self-disappointment has no place for the Christian. However, that's not what the Scriptures teach. The Scriptures teach that if anything, the forgiveness of God makes that struggle harder. Why? Why wouldn't God just take that away? Because God uses that to create within us a deeper longing for His friendship and a deeper enjoyment of His grace. God chooses in His wisdom to allow those, that sense of self-disappointment to continue driving you to the cross, which is the place in which you are given the joy of the Lord You are given the enjoyment of His grace and you are given the gift of the Spirit which causes you to long for His friendship. You know that apart from the work of the Spirit, you will not long for the friendship of God. If you are longing, yearning for the friendship of God, that is the work of the Spirit in your heart because no human does that apart from God. So that is is God's goal. That is God's work to do that in our heart. Instead of freeing us from our ongoing battle with sin, God's forgiveness, in a sense, even makes it harder. Now, that's the first one. Number two is this. The forgiveness of sins is not necessarily the removal of our feelings of shame. Now, shame, remorse, regret for the past, again, is probably one of the most universal of human experiences 
that every single one of us could say, I could do without. I doubt there's anyone who would ever say, boy, that embarrassment from when I said that thing or I did that thing or the shame for when I acted that way. <laughs> I'm glad I've still got that. No, we don't say that. Because shame, remorse, regret from our past moral failures is something that we would just assume never think about again. Once again, pop psychology is going to say to us, this, this pop psychology which has infiltrated the teaching of the church says to us, when God forgives you, He doesn't bring that sin up again, does He? Who's ever heard that? Who's heard it said that once God forgives you, He never brings that sin up again? You got a chapter and a verse for that? Right. That's what we point to. He remembers their sin no more. He banishes the thought from who? Himself. Not from us. In fact, what the Scripture teaches us in regard to our past memories that bring shame and remorse from past moral failures... What the Scripture teaches us is far more nuanced than we would tend to believe. Here's what the Scriptures teach us in regard to our own remembrance, our the, the undesirable thoughts of our past moral failures. Here's what Scripture teaches us. We find places like Matthew 12, 20, uh, Matthew 12, 36, where Jesus says, uh, you will give an account for every idle word that you say. Scary thought. I mean, it's scary enough for me to give an account for every meaningful word that I said, much less every idle word. But we're going to give an account, and so will you. In order to give that account, well, you got to remember it. Okay? So the Scripture talks about giving an account, which means necessarily that those things have not been wiped out of memory. Okay? But then we also find other areas in Scripture in which we seem to have this nuanced approach to what the, what the Christian is to remember and see from the past. We find places like Philippians 3. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Now, that seems to say to us, what's in the past needs to stay there. Don't dig it back up. Your, your future... Is, and if I sound like a TV preacher here, your, your life is the future, not the past. That's what Paul seems to be saying there. But then, just in the next chapter of Ephesians, we find this balanced by things like, therefore, don't forget. Remember, at one time, you were alienated from God and hostile in mind. Or, or Paul says to the Corinthians, you know, there's not going to be liars and homosexuals and adulterers in heaven, and such were some of you. In other words, I, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of Scripture or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, want to remind you of what you used to do. So we have this nuanced approach to our shame of the past, our remorse of the past. Look with me in your notes. This is way too long to be on the screen, but Ezekiel chapter 36. Let's take a look at this. This is an extended section of Scripture in which I put this extended section of Scripture just to, just to make sure we have a proper context for it. So look at, beginning from verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I give your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, etc., etc. Now, what, what does all of that sound like? That sounds like New Covenant language, doesn't it? And that's the reason it's there so that we don't mistake what God's about to say with some sort of Old Covenant 
pre-Christ, pre-cross understanding of life in Christ that was somehow not as full, somehow not as rich, somehow not as vibrant as as life post-cross is, right? So all that is there to say the, the, the prophet Ezekiel is not talking about some sort of Old Testament way of living for God that was much more legalistic than our freedom in Christ now. Because this is full of new covenant language and new covenant imagery. This is God talking about His new covenant in Christ. What does He say immediately next? He says, after all of this, putting my spirit within you, taking your heart of stone, giving you the heart of flesh. After all of this, God says, then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will, what's that word? Loathe yourself. I don't think we're going to hear that in some of the television preachers' sermon circuits. This idea of the new covenant believer loathing themselves. And you will loathe yourself for your iniquities and your abominations. You will be ashamed and confounded in your ways. If that surprises you, that God would say in the context of life in Christ, the believer will think of their sins and loathe themselves. If that surprises you, I could point to six, at least six other places where the scriptures clearly teach that. So what is God saying to us? What God is saying to us is this. He uses, remember what Paul's going to say just a couple chapters later in Romans chapter 8. For those who love God, all things work together for your good. He uses even your shameful remembrances of your past failures. And in fact, not only does he use them, he often brings them up. He often is the one to say, now listen, Corinthians, such were some of you. Listen, Ephesians, remember, you were once hostile to God. Even to Paul, he's going to say, Paul over and over again will never get over the fact of what he used to be. He brings it up some six times in his letters. This is what I used to do. I used to kill Christians. God will even bring that up to once again teach us of the preciousness of His grace to cause us to yearn for His friendship and to cause us to live in a place of great, great joy because we are the forgiven sinner. Now, I want to be quick to point this out too. That God uses our past shame. The forgiveness of God does not erase that. But God uses the shame of our past for good purposes in our life. But the shame that He uses in our life is not a shame that's mixed together with fear of being cast out. That is where the line must be drawn. God never brings to remembrance our past sins in such a way to cause us to fear that He might just cast us out. Take a look with me in the Scriptures at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as He is also, we are in the world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in this, has not been perfected in love. In other words, what John here is saying is that the love of God, as it grows in our hearts, not his love for us, but our love for him, as that love of God grows in us, its enemy, the enemy of our love for God, is our fear that he'll cast us out. If we think in our in the back of our mind, you know what? God might just one day get really tired of us. He might just exhaust his patience with us. Maybe his grace is not truly immeasurable. If that exists in our heart and in our mind, then that fights against the love for God. And our love for God only grows and blossoms as our heart in faith knows He will never, by no means, will He ever cast us out. If we are in His Son, there is no punishment for our sins because His Son has suffered the punishment for all of our sins, right? So 
the shame that God wants to bring to us of the remembrance of our moral failures is not a shame that should create within us the fear that He will cast us out. Instead, it's the type of moral remorse or regretfulness that is the seedbed for the joy of the Lord, for the the experiencing of the grace of the Lord, and for the yearning, the deep yearning for the friendship of God. That's the fruit that it produces. Take a look with me again in your notes, Romans chapter 6 on the next page. Romans chapter 6, this is a type of shame that God's forgiveness brings to us that's mingled together with security. Put that in your mind, the idea of shame and security together. Because in the human experience, what does shame mean? Shame means insecurity. When you are ashamed, you feel insecure. However, with God, it's the reverse. With God, when He brings this sense of awareness of our past failures, it's not one that's coupled together with insecurity, but instead it's coupled together with security. Take a look at Romans chapter 6. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? In other words, Paul says to the Romans, you remember that time? Sounds like a theme, doesn't it? Do you remember that time when you were living in such iniquity? You remember that time when your sins were so great and you were so far from God? You remember that? Paul says, what fruit did those things bring for you? He says, for the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, in other words, That was before your forgiveness. Now, before your forgiveness, all these things that you used to do and think and and say, what fruit did they bring you? They brought you no fruit. They brought you death. But now you've been forgiven. And Paul says, the fruit that you now get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the free gift of God is life in Christ, right? So Paul says there's a fruit that comes from your sin, from the shame of your sins. Prior to forgiveness, that fruit was death. Post-forgiveness, now that you have been forgiven, that fruit is life, sanctification, security, growth in Christ, increased yearning for His friendship, increased appreciation for His forgiveness, increased love. For the Father. William Greenhill wrote back in the 17th century God's forgiveness teaches us to say, What have we done? How we have sinned against a God of love, mercy, and grace. We must not do it again. This couples together perfectly. If we had more time, we could take a look at the Beatitudes at how Jesus is teaching of being poor in spirit, of mourning and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about.